Okay, so I've been charged with talking about the low frequency radio trend in Sky, so I thought first off I should, should give some definition of that because it's an arbitrary title. Because I'm sure everyone in the room thinks that anything below uh, a micron is, is short for some of you, but for, for the radio trend in Sky, I wanted to put some definition on that. And here I'll give just a log plot of radio frequencies, and what I'm defining as low here is anything below about 300 megahertz. And historically, that's where radio astronomy began, uh, starting with Jansky's observations in the 30s at 20 megahertz, uh, and, and, and the first radio transient was, was discovered at this very low band. Pulsars were discovered in 68 with, uh, or excuse me, 67 with uh, uh, observations at 80 megahertz. What happened uh, in the 50s and 60s, particularly, was a progression towards higher frequencies, motivated by a number of factors. One, it was easier to build dish telescopes which had better sensitivity because you could build receivers that were not limited by the noise in the sky but by their own, uh, uh, by their own temperatures. And then secondly, going to higher frequencies meant better resolution, better uh, localization of sources, which was a very key goal in the 50s and 60s. And that led to an era where we have telescopes that were ever marching to higher frequencies, like the JVLA, which was, which was upgraded in the last few years at gigahertz frequencies. And more recently, we now, of course, have the wonderful AMA telescope operating uh, uh, at you know, hundreds of gigahertz frequencies. However, there is now a resurgence in observations at lower frequencies. Motivated largely actually by cosmology rather than transients, uh, the potential to maybe tr try and track uh, the evolution of the IGM in the cosmic dawn and e epoch reionization era, largely motivated by work by Avi and others. Uh, looking for the variation in brightness temperature of the H1 line at high redshift. And here is a plot uh, from Pritchard and Loeb 2010, which shows the departure of that line from the CMB temperature across that epoch. So there's a lot of potential there for cosmology in terms of understanding what's, how, the, how that line varies over cosmic time. And that's really led to a huge resurgence in activity of these frequencies, a lot of investment in time, in expenditure, and resources to try and, and open up this regime, because it's not easy. Uh, there, the, there are a lot of problems with observing at low frequencies, like the RFI problems that, that David mentioned, uh, the ionosphere varying, and so forth, but there's been great progress made in the last decade. Uh, that includes modification of existing telescopes, like the VLA now has a commensal uh, continuous low frequency system called VLIT. The GMRT in India is undergoing a major upgrade, but probably more, even more significantly is the slew of new telescopes being built. Uh, this includes, uh, and, and David already has covered some of this, this includes LOFAR uh, in, in Europe, operating between 10 and 240 megahertz, MWA, which is covered by David, and then you have also the LWA, the Long Wave and the Array in uh, the US. That's actually multiple efforts. Uh, there's, an array, there's an array in New Mexico that's been operating for a few years, and then there's an array in California that we, my group's just built that uses the same antenna, but it's a very, very different uh, instrument uh, designed to image the entire sky. So all these arrays have something in common. Uh, instead of using a dish, they're using a dipole. Uh, the advantage there is that uh, you can get a very large field of view at a cost. And the cost is that if you want to have a collecting area that's giving you any kind of sensitivity, you have to have a lot of dipoles. But that's not a problem as long as you have the CPUs or GPUs or whatever your computational back end of choice is to back that up. Uh, if you combine enough dipoles, you get a lot of sensitivity, and in addition, you get a very large field of view. Now, there are some trade-offs to be made. Uh, LOFAR, for example, has dipoles all across Europe. And if you wanted to image the entire sky with the, with the corresponding resolution, the images would be huge, the processing would be far too expensive. So they, rather than combining every dipole with every other dipole, they group their dipoles into stations, and, they, and those stations have 96 dipoles, and that gives them a field of view of you know, a few degrees. As David described, MWA groups their, their uh, dipoles into six, groups of 16, which gives them a much larger field of view of hundreds to 1,000 square degrees. In our array in New Mexico, we decided to take it to the logic limit and combine every dipole with every other dipole. And we image the entire sky uh, uh, every 10 seconds or so. So there, so there are various trades off in sensitivity, collecting area, and resolution you make depending on your science. In our case, for example, we're very focused on trying to uh, detect transients and do cosmology at high redshift, which, which, and you win by having a large field of view. But the, co the cost computation is very, is very high. So uh, this array, that, that the LWA that I'm talking about, actually is, is still in construction. We've built two phases, phase one in 2013 to 2014, and phase two in 2015. Phase three will finish in 2017, and at the end of that, it will be an array of 352 antennas, uh, spaced over about 2.6 kilometers. And here I'm showing the core, 
and then you have basically dipoles spread across about a couple of kilometers. You'll know that all the photographs you'll see of these arrays are aerial shots with drones. That's because a uh, dipole is nowhere near as impressive from the ground as a big, as a big dish. Uh, in, in fact, they're, it's, they're very unimpressive when you're close up. What's impressive is what happens at the back end. The computation resources that are used and the amount of, amount of processing that, that's required to deliver the science is in itself impressive. So here is the obligatory drone shot of our array, just, sh just coming up and showing the, the central core, about 20 meters across. And like I said, we've just finished stage two, and the early science in this array will be arriving this summer. So hopefully you'll be seeing the first science papers later on this year. Uh, so under the, you have, in this case, for the core, we have about 256 antennas. And underneath, that, underneath those antennas, you have about, underneath the ground there, rather, you have about 80 kilometers worth of coaxial cable passing all the signals to your central core. So here's an example of an image of one of these arrays, uh, the LWA in this case, uh, with, with its all sky field of view. This is a 10 second image now showing the entire radio sky all at once uh, with thousands of galaxies detected. Uh, when we finish stage three, we'll actually be able to detect something like 30 or 40,000 galaxies in every single image. So there was a survey of the VLA about 10 years ago at 74 megahertz that surveyed the entire sky at these frequencies, took about 1,000 hours. In a single 20 second snapshot, we get every single one of those galaxies in the sky. So that's kind of telling you how progression has allowed us now to survey very large field of views uh, in a very short uh, period of time. Here's a zoomed in view showing all the AGN and supernova remnants and diffuse emission as uh, David described. So for transient science, what can we expect to detect? And to be honest, David's covered most of this, so I won't, I won't labor on this. I completely agree that what's unlikely uh, uh, is that most classes of exogalactic explosive events will not be detected, will not be uh, identified. You can detect them, for sure, but they're varying on decades and century timescales. So identification is the problem, right? It's not the kind of project you want to give to a graduate student, try and find a, 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 a events varying on, on century timescales. F4Bs, it's a question mark because, as has been described by David, MWA has done some surveys and put some limits on, 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 what, they have, on what the expected, uh, expected index would be. Vicky's talk, I think, gave even stronger constraints, showing that, that uh, if they are at low frequencies, they would have to have a very flat spectral index. And in fact, I think that's probably, uh, there's a lot of reasons to expect that we won't detect them at low frequencies due to scattering or absorption, propagation effects, basically, unless they're very close by. There are a lot of uh, ongoing efforts that are doing science that are kind of uh, uh, similar to what I want to discuss here, which is transients in the image plane. Uh, David showed that you can actually use these arrays to detect extrinsic variability, uh, like interplanetary scintillation. There's been nice work on meteor fireballs. Every time a meteor passes through the atmosphere, it leaves an ionizing train that, sees that these low-frequency telescopes can see. Uh, there's been really nice work in cosmic arrays with LOFAR, and also with LOFAR on pulsars. But I want to really focus on is what the expected populations of transients will be with these new telescopes, now that they're, now that they're really gearing up into their science mode. Uh, I think you, what, what I think are the, are, the, are the highest priority, most exciting events will be those associated with what I'm calling extrasolar space weather. Stellar coronal mass ejections and the associated radio emission from extrasolar planets. You will also see some synchron sources in our own galaxy, I think. And it may be the case that in certain, for, for, for example, new star merger events, you may see uh, radio emission uh, on year timescales rather than decade timescales. Uh, and examples of these galactic synchrotron sources would be magnetar flares, as was mentioned, and also uh, extra binary emission. Uh, I want to also talk about a, a new po a population that's been discovered and known about for a decade that's been a mystery, which is these galactic center radio transients. And of course, what's always the case when you open new parameter space is the serendipitous. So to start, I want to talk about two examples of bona fide radio transients that have been found, not in these, in these new surveys, but in archival data from the VLA that really motivates us to try and do this kind of survey. Uh, this is the mysterious GCRT, which is a galactic center radio transient, J7045-3009. This is an event that was found in archival VLA data at 330 megahertz, uh, covering the galactic center region, and up popped a pulsing source, a period of about uh, 77 minutes, and to a flux density of about a Jansky. This is a really big discovery at the time. Got a lot of people very excited. It was redetected really actually by the GMRT in India also at a later date. But localization, the resolution was too poor to give you a robust localization, particularly in the dense region in question near the galactic center. Dev Kappa did some nice work uh, in terms of trying to find out what the counterpart might be. Lots of theories were put forward regarding whether it's a nulling pulsar, a white dwarf pulsar, a brown dwarf, and it remains a mystery. Uh, and I think it will remain a mystery until we find more of these events at higher spatial resolution and finally localize 
and find out what they actually are. Uh, some re nice work done recently with the VLA, with its VLight commensal survey data, was to show that actually their all sky array limits uh, this event to be somewhere. It limits it from, limits it from being an isotropic uh, sky distribution. It must be some, It must have been biased towards the galactic center when, when it was detected. So uh, I think I think the the way to find more of these events is to look towards the galactic center. And in fact, this group have found other events, not pulsing, but other events towards that same region, which indicates this is a rich region, regime to try and pursue transients. Here's another event. Uh, the Swire radio transient, which was discovered in archival data also at the same frequency uh, in the Swire region, deep field. And, and there was this one event, this one transient event found in these data where there was no evidence for any host galaxy, and no astronomical counterpart, and remains in history to this day also. So these are, these are two examples of bona fide transients in archival data that demonstrate that there is some parameter space that has a population to, to pursue. So, uh, as Dave already mentioned, these new surveys are ramping up. LOFAR has started producing its first results, as is MWA. Um, the other way is gearing up. In my opinion, the big limitation has been not the telescope, but more, you know, the post correlation data processing. How you, the, the, the amount of data produced by these telescopes is enormous. For example, the LWA produces about 30 terabytes per day of data you have to, you have to get through. Uh, so I think the main limitation has been the pipelines and the personnel required to get through that data. Uh, as Dave has already mentioned, the first, data, the first surveys have shown uh, a, a possible detection here. This is the same event that David covered, where there was one event that showed up in 11 minutes of data and was never seen again. But I want to emphasize, this is a 400-hour survey, but it was actually utilizing only a very small fraction of the sensitivity of LOFAR. They only used 200, 200 kilohertz of bandwidth, which is literally one three hundredth of the full bandwidth they have available to them. And their field of view is actually quite small for these frequencies. It was about 200 square degrees. So in, in, in fact, the results that this, this one detection, uh, even though it was 400 hours of data, is not very, uh, the actual survey itself was not very deep. When you look at it on the, on the same log log plot, the, it, this is a, a figure from the same paper, and the blue lines correspond to where their sensitivity limit is. And this kind of shows the, the state of play of the radio transient sky at these frequencies right now. So you have uh, various upper limits, but you also have the, a, a few detections. So, so the Ts correspond to the t detections, and it amounts to three bona fide radio transients at these frequencies. So you have the two events I already showed you, and the new event from LOFAR. But in reality, the sensitivity limits are very, very, I think, weak compared to what these telescopes are capable of. I think the MWA and LOFAR should push really far into this regime. And I know that the LWA, we just finished our first 100-hour survey, and we should be down in this regime here. Uh, if these events are real, we should detect many per day. So uh, I, think the, the, I think we're in an exciting time. I'm hoping in the next year or so we really establish whether there's a population there and we, we finally learn how to, man, how to master the fire hose of data coming from these telescopes. Now, uh, what I want to talk about for the remainder of the talk is what I think is the most important population to tackle. And that is uh, nearby stars and their planets. And try to understand whether or not magnetic activity itself is important for defining habitability and understanding that, that process as a function of spectral type, age, and mass. Uh, in particular, we know in our own solar system that it had a, a, a severe effect. So uh, results from the MAVEN mission to Mars directly determined that Mars lost uh, the bulk of its atmosphere due to the activity of the sun, specifically due to the long-term uh, impact of coronal mass ejections over many giga years. When you consider that within the context of the other rocky planets in our solar system, we've got Venus, which is not quite in the habitable zone. We have Earth in the habitable zone. Mars, at the very edge of the habitable zone, uh, this activity has, a very, has had a very important impact. Venus lost the water in its atmosphere by the, to the same effect. Uh, Mars used to have a magnetic field. It lost its magnetic field and lost its atmosphere. Luckily for us, Earth has a magnetic field, and that actually provides a shield, direct shield, to the activity of the sun. It shields from the, from the CME and solar wind impact. So this becomes a very important effect, in, in, even in our own solar system. And when you take a step back and look at the, the local uh, solar neighborhood, uh, there's a pretty important story to tell here. So of course, our sun's a G-type star, and you often hear the, the phrase, our sun's an average star. In reality, it's not an average star. It's a larger than average star. Most stars are lower in mass, particularly, obviously, K dwarfs, and you can see the M dwarfs completely dominate the population. And M dwarfs are now the, a very exciting topic in the study and the pursuit of exosolar planets. For obvious reasons, really, uh, most old stars are M dwarfs. And results from Kepler have shown that rocky planets are frequent around M dwarfs. 
at least one per, plant, per star, typically. And you, you combine all that together, and Dressing and Sharpen have shown that the nearest habitable planet almost certainly orbits an M dwarf at a very close distance of only two and a half parsecs, parsecs away. But the definition of habitability may need to be redefined based on the activity of the star itself. Why is that? Well, first of all, the planets orbiting M dwarfs are much closer to the parent star. So any activity they have in the form of flares, or in the case I was discussing, coronal mass ejections is magnified by the fact that the planet is much closer to the star. Here I'm just showing uh, a cartoon diagram which is showing the mass of the star and the, and the habitable zone distance. Another very important effect is how long a star is active for. So it turns out that the most active stars in our galaxies are actually G dwarfs. So the sun, the sun was a very, very active star, but it was only a very active star for a very short period of time because uh, that activity is powered by rotation. Uh, and, and the sun rotated much faster as a young star, but due to that activity, due to the X-ray luminosity and due to the, uh, leave, the, the ejected solar wind, it, it lost its angular momentum, it spun down. And that, in any breaking, removes, you know, slows the star down, and basically as it slows down, it becomes more middle-aged and sedentary, well-behaved older star. What you see for the uh, M dwarves is that they're active for much longer. The spin down time scale, the activity lifetime, is much, much longer for M dwarves, such that an M4 dwarf is active for many giga years. So not only are these planets much closer to the star, they're also being bombarded for much longer. So how do we remote sense uh, uh, flares and CMEs? For the case of flares, it's very easy, and it has been done for decades. When you have a flare on an M dwarf, it's very bright, uh, and typically, because the M dwarf photosphere is so cool, it shows up as a very bright uh, flare in the optical band. For coronal mass ejections, it's a more difficult question. In our own uh, solar system, we remotely sense CMEs by two means. This is actually a movie that's not playing, but uh, we use uh, either uh, scattered, uh, Thompson scattered light, uh, uh, as, as is done by missions like SOHO, and, was first, and that's how CMEs were first conclusively detected in the 70s, was via this uh, Thompson scattered optical light. Uh, of course, that's not a very good technique to apply to other stars. The other way we detect uh, this kind of event in our own solar system is via radio bursts. Here is a dynamic spectrum where frequencies on the, on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. When you have a fast coronal mass ejection, you have a bright radio burst. Uh, usually type 2 or type 4. Uh, and it's basically associated with the shock propagating outwards out, out from the corona into the interplanetary medium. And the radio emission itself is produced at the local plasma frequency. So it tracks density. That's why it's sweeping uh, across this, this uh, diagram from uh, high to low frequencies. That's because the shock wave is propagating outwards uh, uh, through the corona and eventually into the interplanetary medium. So that's a real signature that tells you uh, that you have a CME occurring. And it was, it was actually detected for the first time in the, in the 1940s. So uh, oh, this, is, this is actually a movie as well, too, that's not playing, I'm sorry to say. This, this, this shows the, uh, an Oscar image where we have the sun present just as it undergoes a CME. Happily, I have a, another movie on the next slide that does work, which shows the same CME uh, uh, as it occurs. So this actually is a resolved image of the, of the sun in our data. The good thing about the LWA is that we see the sun all the time every day when it's, when it's above the horizon. It's actually resolved by the, by the LWA. It's, uh, it's actually the, the uh, optically thick uh, free free emission high up in the corona you see, so you don't see the photosphere. You see a much more structured optically thick uh, uh, disk. And what we see on, this, on the uh, west limb is that you have this uh, CME event occurring. And that gets tremendously bright. Uh, in this case, for example, the, the brightness of the sun uh, is about uh, 200 Janskis per beam, uh, whereas the actual event that occurs reaches about a mega Jansky, so a hugely bright event. And they get much brighter. This is the brightest event we're aware of, detected by uh, Ruby Payne Scott uh, in 1947, published in Nature, a huge event that reached 10 to the 11 Janskis. Uh, I don't need to explain the units, 10 to the 11 of anything is large. Uh, and this, this event was so large that if you had a radio telescope on some nearby planet, orbiting some nearby star, and you pointed back towards uh, uh, the sun, you would have picked up that, you would detect that event pretty easily, actually. The problem is when to look, right? This might happen, from, uh, this, kind of illumin, this kind of brightness might happen, you know, once every decade. But if you're not watching at the right time, how do you, how do you detect it? So if you've got a normal dish telescope where you're just like pointing at a star, one star at a time, you'll miss these events. But when you're doing all scale imaging, you're monitoring thousands of systems simultaneously, looking for these kind of events. And that's what you need to do. In the same way we monitor the sun, 
uh, for space weather. We need to monitor uh, a nearby stellar systems on a continuous basis for the same reason. There are evidence of many such similar kind of bursts from nearby M dwarfs. Here's an example published as early as 1976, where a nearby M dwarf was found to produce a bright radio burst at low frequencies, and you actually had a bright optical burst that signi signified that likely you were having a, 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 big, a large flare. Well, certainly you were having a large flare. The question is what was happening in the radio? Was it also a flare, or was it actually the signature of a coronal mass ejection? In this case, at that time, it was, it was difficult to do wideband observations so you can track that structure across the time frequency plane, but these new generation of telescopes uh, will be able to pick that up. Uh, so this was a targeted observation done in 1976 of just, you know, a nearby M dwarf. If that event happened right now in, in the MWA or in the low far or in the LWA beam, we'd see it. So these, these are the kind of events I think we should, we should, we'll be looking for and hopefully we'll be able to determine whether or not these stars have the same kind of CMEs we have. And it's a very important question. The magnetic fields, I'm showing here uh, the magnetic fields of an M dwarf. It's very different to what we see for the, for the sun, which has you know, a, an alpha omega dynamo that produces very complex toroidal uh, field structures near the equator. In this case, it's a fully convective star with a very different dynamo. And you have this large scale, almost uh, 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 it's a large scale, predominantly dipolar field that's very strong. What happens when you have a CME go off inside that? Does it, get, does it blow the field open or does it get redirected by the uh, magnetic field lines out towards the polar regions, for example, away from the planets? Those are questions we can address directly. And we can look for those kind of events from nearby uh, stars and planets, and then simultaneously, you know, in parallel, you've got uh, observations in the optical uh, through things like transit spectroscopy, it will give you direct measurements of what the atmosphere of the planets look like. So you're gonna be able to couple data like this and determine what stars have, you know, bright CMEs, and which ones of those are actually uh, impacting the atmosphere of the planets. Uh, similarly, and probably even more exciting, is the possibility of detecting planets. This is the, the long game, this is the, 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 the big goal, I think, for, for transient science, is trying to find extrasolar planets. All the planets in our solar system that have magnetic fields are bright radio sources. The radio emission is associated with the same electrons that give you the aurora, for example. Uh, and uh, the emission itself is an exotic process called the electron cyclotron maser instability. The key point is it's produced almost exactly at the electron gyro frequency, so it tracks magnetic field strength. So the plot on the left here shows uh, flux density and on the, on the x axis frequency, and we see that all the planets that have magnetic fields have this bright radio emission. The, uh, if, you, if you just zone in on Jupiter, it's quite a busy plot. If you see Jupiter, Jupiter's radio emission cuts off at about 40 megahertz sharply. Uh, if, you have, if you have a dipole at 25 megahertz, you detect Jupiter. If you have the VLA at 45, you can't detect it. And that's because the radio emission, like I said, is produced at the, at the electron gyro frequency, and it cuts off uh, in the upper atmosphere when you reach the upper atmosphere. So basically, that's the maximum field strength in the Jovian mean sphere. And that's, first, that, that, that's how we first determined that Jupiter had a magnetic field. For all the other planets, it's at such low frequencies, we can't even detect it from the ground. It's below the ionospheric cutoff. So they, they were all detected from either satellites orbiting Earth or uh, vi via the vo Voyage mission. So the exciting possibility is trying to detect this same kind of emission from exoplanets orbiting nearby stars. Uh, it's, the, it's the only way we know of to measure directly the magnetic fields of exoplanets, and once again, determine if that has an impact on whether or not those planets uh, retain an atmosphere. Looking 25, 30 years down the line, when we're actually trying to probe directly the atmospheres of habitable planets, can we simultaneously try and determine whether those same planets have magnetic fields, and is there a correlation? They're the, they're the kind of long-term uh, goals for these kind of projects. It also allows you to measure the rotation rate, because the emission pulses at the rotation period, and it provides insight into the internal structure of the planet. If it's got a magnetic field, it must have a convective interior. Uh, so these are really the, the, the lofty goals for what we want to try and do this, this kind of science. It's been tried for 30 years, uh, many, many times, uh, by many, many groups with no detections. Uh, the expectation is we should see it, and that expectation is based on the, on the plot on the left here. It's kind of hard to see. It's small, it's small writing, but what I'm showing is the radio power on the y-axis from a rural emission versus the incident power on the planet uh, that drives that emission. So in the Earth's case, uh, what powers the Earth's radio emission is the impact of the, so the kinetic energy of the, so of the solar wind. If you move a planet closer to the star, uh, that's more power, it gets brighter. So extrapolating all the way up, things like hot Jupiters, you might expect very, very bright radio emission. Uh, as long as the magnetic fields are strong enough that you can detect them in your band. On the right-hand side here, uh, groups have done calculations of what the expected flux might be for all the known exoplanets. 
And then the, the net result is it's actually very low frequency, but it's also very faint. However, uh, this uh, plot assumes just normal stellar conditions. What I'm showing here is the uh, solar wind power, sorry, the, uh, the, the power in the Earth's auroral radio emission as a function of solar wind speed. Varying the solar wind speed by a factor of two or three gives you a factor of a thousand increase in, in the Earth's radio luminosity. When does that happen? Whenever you've got a CME from the, Earth, from the sun that impacts the Earth, it lights up like a Christmas tree. You've got this you know, hugely increase in the radio emission. So once again, you, you, you have to watch. You can't just look at a planet and say, I've, I've observed that planet. You've got to watch the system and look for that time when that CME goes off, hits the planet, and you get that huge increase in radio luminosity. So, for example, with the LWA, we have a project where we monitor the sky continuously in the radio in collaboration with uh, uh, Robert Quimby and Nick Law uh, with our optical every scope, which also images a large fraction of the sky. We're now looking for simultaneous observations of thousands of stars in the radio and optical to try and find these kind of emissions. And I hope this will be one of the, the, new, the new fields that will be opened up by these telescopes. Okay. Uh, at radio wavelengths? Uh, there are limitations. I mean, right now, to be honest, we're only doing campaigns. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, right now, I mean, the idea of us doing continuous observation is also assuming we can handle the data. Right now, we can't. We've done a 100-hour campaign, and I think we need a lot more storage before we can actually observe continuously. OK, to summarize, uh, there's a new gen generation of radio telescopes that have come online, and there have been improvements to the existing, uh, the existing instruments. I think that in all cases, time domain science has been, has been identified as a key science driver for all these new and upgraded facilities. Um, as Dave pointed out, there's been very few detections, but I think that's more, limit, that's more to do with uh, handling the data than the telescope sensitivity itself. The fire hose of data coming out of these telescopes is severe, and I think we're still learning how to, use, how to handle those data and produce science. Uh, I think that, a, and as my last few slides showed, I think a really high priority will be the detection of stellar CMEs and planetary radio emission and its impact on habitability. Okay, thank you. Great, and uh, as you know, I think uh, the planetary area is really interesting as well. To comment, one thing that I think is especially fun is um, you mentioned that uh, you can tell the internal structure, see whether a planet has a convective core by whether it's generating a dynamo. And uh, from planetary science, we believe that one of the things that lets you have a uh, convective core is active geology higher in the mantle, so plate tectonics. So I just want to mention that uh, radio observations, you know, if you can detect a planet, a rocky planet, in radio waves, you can intentionally diagnose whether it has active geology like the Earth which I think is a, it's far off, but it's really cool. I totally agree. <laughs> That's right, you get, a, you get an independent measure of, of things like orbital and rotational variability. Greg, I just wanted to make the point that uh, one thing we've learned, I think, from studies of exoplanets is that uh, everything we see out there is different than, than our solar system. So. To some extent, I would caution in, in, in this direction of just drawing a direct analogy when it comes to radio emission. And I think one of the potential signatures of that is that uh, you know, Peter Williams and I just had a, a paper recently where we showed the detection of a brown dwarf uh, in uh, ALMA data in a millimeter with essentially a flat spectrum that goes all the way from 1 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz with no cutoff. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we should be so open-minded um, to the idea that maybe the emission from these exoplanets is not going to be similar to what we see from Jupiter and cuts off at low frequency, but could potentially continue to much higher frequencies. I'm not sure that we fully understand the uh, emission processes and, and the magnetic field structures to, to make that analogy. Well, I think Jupiter also has emission. That, you know, Jupiter has a coherent, bright, low-frequency component, but it also has an incoherent synchrotron component that's, you know, all the way up to high frequency also. That would be the, I think, the possible anal analogy there. So I think that uh, you're completely right. You should never make assumptions about that you're going to see the same phenomena that we see in our own solar system. Uh, but I do think you can generalize that when you've got magnetospheres and you've got a V-cross B somewhere in that magnetosphere, stuff's going to happen. I think that's the assumption we're trying to make here. And we do have the case, I mean, brown dwarfs are a good example. You do have this incoherent emission that, that uh, I completely agree is, is not analogous with, with, with uh, the aurora phenomena. But you also have this post emission that's tremendously bright uh, that, that sits nicely on a diagram of how your radio power scales with input power. So I do think there's at least evidence that the radio phenomena we see in our solar system 
does scale up to that kind of power, where we can detect it at these frequencies. The hope is we can do the same for exosolar planets. And I think the biggest concern I have, actually, is more that the magnetic fields would be too weak uh, to be detected from the ground. That's my biggest concern. In our own solar system, only Jupiter has strong enough fields to be detected uh, at the moment. So that's my biggest concern.